Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming again to, uh, this is our final speaker for this semester. So we will have more of this in the spring. Um, I am very happy to introduce my, um, let's see, former colleague, former student, friend, collaborator, et cetera, um, Silvina Lopez Barrera. Uh, she is an assistant, probably soon associate professor in the School of Architecture at Miss. What? Assistant. Professor. Assistant. Okay, we don't want to jinx it. So, an assistant professor in the School of Architecture at Mississippi State University. Um, she's a licensed architect in Uruguay. So, if you guys remember Paraguay, Uruguay is next door. <laughs> um, She's also lead AP accredited and holds a Master of Architecture degree from Iowa State University. Her research focuses on how socio-spatial inequalities influence informal housing, housing insecurity, and community resilience in the U.S. and in Latin America. Silvina's fieldwork methods incorporate oral histories and participatory processes to engage with disadvantaged communities. Her research has been published in several academic journals, including Local Development and Society, as well as Local Environment, the International Journal of Justice and Sustainability. She has published book chapters in Informality and the City, Theories, Actions, and Interventions, and in Public Space, Contested Space, imagination and occupation. Prior to joining the faculty at Mississippi State, um, <clears throat> Silvina was faculty member at Iowa State University and Middlebury College. She's a member of the Uruguayan Society of Architects and an international member of the American Institute of Architects. She currently serves in the AIA National Associates Committee as the AIA Mississippi State Associate representative. So welcome, Sylvina. That's my Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Nadia, for the presentation. And thank you, um, all of you, for hosting me here today. Um, so today I'm going to, uh, I'm going to present on the title of my uh, presentation talks, I'm going to present on housing struggles uh, in the Americas. Um, but housing struggles um, frame through the lenses of um, the right to the city. And I will specifically talk about uh, housing typologies and the role of housing typologies shaping a lived spaces and experiences of a immigrant communities in the US. Um, and also what is the, what had been those uh, more predom uh, predominant uh, forms of architectural forms that have, a, that have been prevalent over time um, in the United States and in, in Latin America. I want to start with a quote. May I read from here? Quote, we were the first ones that obtained electricity and the neighbors fought to get the streets constructed. The neighbors did it with its own money. We did not wait to obtain the assistance of the district mayor or the government. The same for the water. The neighbors always collaborated and fought. It accessed and built its own public infrastructure and services. These are the words of a resident of an informal neighborhood in Lima. There's no news that there is a global housing crisis. More than 1.8 billion people around the world 
do not have access to adequate and secure housing. Living in substandard housing and informal settlements with limited access to infrastructure and basic services like potable water, sanitation, electricity are among the most common issues, while also being at risk of potential displacement and evictions. Access to adequate housing is critical to many aspects of daily life, including health, mental health, physical health, quality of life. Access to adequate housing affects all aspects of life, including access to education, access to healthcare, access to jobs, and access to economic opportunities, and many other aspects of life. Over the decades, architects and um, designers and urban planners have struggled to understand the social production of informal housing and its implication in everyday life. Special justice theory argues that uh, special inequalities created by unjust, um, unjust urbanizations and uneven uh, geographical development systematically oppress segments of the population, reducing their well-being, their participation on social life, and their access to resources. Lefebvre's work in, in, and framework of the right to the city emphasize the idea that special, spatial injustice can be challenged by those who are negatively affected by embracing the right to occupy and transport and transform space. In the most basic form, informal housing and self-help housing, like what you can see here in, in, this, in this image, is it embodies this uh, the right to transform space. It embodies the right to the city. It solves housing needs through direct action. It ensures ha a secure housing and access to resources. This image is from Lima and it is from the same neighborhood that we started a, with a quote at the beginning of the presentation. So informal housing and self-housing, self-help housing, are strategies that can challenge uneven development and can challenge unjust urbanization processes. Trying to ensure a more equitable access to resources. These are grassroots initiatives. So what does it have to do with the Americas, right? We always, like it, it's very general to think that informal housing occurs in the Southern hemisphere in developing countries. In general, housing informality, scholarship, studies and interventions has focused in the global South pertinent to the topic of this lecture series. We reduce attention to cases in the global north, for lack of a better word. Exploring case studies of informal housing in the Americas, I'm aimed to challenge common assumptions among academics and practitioners where informal housing only occurs, uh, are only occurs in the South and are only issues related to metropolitan areas. To this end, I study informal housing spatial practices, how people use and occupy space. What are the um, socioeconomic results uh, and what are the responses to um, structural inequalities to access to housing. In my methods, 
in my research methods, I include semi-structure interviews uh, with uh, residents and um, from different areas. And the information that you're gonna see all today throughout this lecture is a, are a series uh, are results from interviews in, in Lima, in Uruguay, in Vermont, in Mississippi, in different places. And I also use architectural uh, documentation, um, on-site uh, observation methods, and uh, including sketches, photographs, drawings, and secondary resources. But what is informality? What is informal housing? Is it difficult to define? It's difficult to define. There is no one definition. And oftentimes there is no reliable data to, to, make, a, to make, that allow us to make definitions and that allow us to conduct research and overall research. So it's very important that the research on this topic is is rooted in communities. And um, so some existing literature allows us to define some of the characteristics of informal housing. And um, the characteristics that I listed here are relevant today for this topic because these are characteristics that are present in both in informal housing in Latin America and in the US. Yes, in the US, we do have informal housing. And we are gonna see there are different types of informal housing. So some of the characteristics include, the common characteristics include the, um, the informal subdivision of land in the US, one of the most common or, a, or more studied cases of informal subdivision of land is the, um, are the colonias in the US-Mexico uh, border. Also housing that is not compliant with building codes, regulations, and hybridized forms of informal housing where there are combinations of informal land tenure or informal a, a rental system. Paris, a, through a, a, a in-depth study of urban informality around the globe, defined different types of informality. And a, he classified them in different types. When I was looking at, when I look at uh, the cases of Latin America and in the US, I see these types of informality are the most prevalent. Uh, informality can be concentrated and visible when you, when it's present, uh, one of the most uh, obvious cases are informal settlements and the informal city. But informality can also be diffused and concealed. And perhaps that's one of the most uh, prevalent forms of informality in the US. And also there are hybridized forms of informality as well. Although informal housing in both the United States and Latin America is in the most basic form an attempt to solve basic housing needs. But their social production and their architectural forms are quite different. In Latin America, informal housing in general involves some type of a communal organization and sense of, co of collectiveness. Um, this is usually revealed um, on how uh, communities negotiate their access to land, their access to um, 
to public services and infrastructure. The spatial result of this uh, of these negotiations are a uh, complex spatial delineations um, that are self-regulated uh, and where private property and public space boundaries are blurred. So when we look at the right to the city and the right to housing, we look at how people appropriate space, how people transform, use the space and occupy the space. And we do this for both the US and Latin America. In this image, you see some of this complicated uh, uh, negotiations, what is the, the form that these complication, complicated delineations between public and private space take, where there are not only uh, areas that are on a kind of interstitial between hard to define that if they belong to a certain house or a group of houses, and areas that are become part of the public realm. Unlike the, the, the physical manifestation of informality of informal housing in Latin America, in the US, a informal housing tends to be the result of individual, uh, individual actions. Um, and instead of collective actions uh, or collective organized practices. Um, this is reflected in this, um, in this form that is the resulting form that is dispersed and oftentimes concealed uh, from the traditional urban fabric. Um, and, and this, these characteristics of being um, of being concealed and being dispersed, it affects and influences the ability and the capacity for communities to self-organize to claim their right to the city. To um, it affects their capacity, their ability uh, to um, to effectively uh, um, and collectively. Um, uh, organized to uh, seek their uh, resources. As John Turner described in his studies of the Barriadas in Peru, the informal city may seem chaotic at first glance, but it exists and grows in a, in a form of self-regulated system. It is a living ecosystem, um, and it's critical un to understand how the architecture and how architects can operate and embrace this dynamic nature of the informal city to effectively improve the well-being of this inha its inhabitants. It's, I realize that these images are a bit blurry, but these are studies of a housing a housing typologies in Lima in in informal settlements in Lima and and some of some of the characteristics here that I was that I was I was uh, highlighting is trying to understand what is the logic of this how these informal houses grow and accommodate uh, and change and evolve over time to accommodate the different Households uh, uh, changes. The, as the family grows, as the uh, as the original lower floor becomes a, a business, small business enterprise, and so on. So there are. It's important to understand how the logics. Uh, what are the logics of the informal city? When we look at informal housing and self-help housing as a participatory grassroots practice, and it's important that it's 
the emphasis that I gave is in participatory grassroots practice because it's done from the bottom up. And it's done both from the bottom up as in response to a need that, a, a, that is, has not been solved, a, that needs to be addressed. So this practice is, a, is, in, is in continuous process of improvement. So one of the, a, one of the most striking aspects about in urban informality and informal housing is that it's never complete. It's always ongoing and it's under construction and it's a under improvement and it's always under adaptation. So some of these, some of these images are, a, I, I, I kind of show how a structure, for example, this one that started as a, as a small, very basic housing dwelling, it quickly, it turns the front facade, that window into a, into a business, right? to in response to a need to uh, to access to a job okay to create that livelihood and then this image so this this is in Uruguay this is in Mississippi these are prefabricated structures these are structures that are designed and prefabricated uh, as shed structures for storage that you will put in your backyard, right? I'm pretty sure all of you have seen this type of structures. What I have been noticing, what I have been uh, recording, systematically recording in my research is that this type of structures are one of the uh, prevalent forms of urban informality in the American South. Um, and where these very precarious prefabricated structures, they, are transformed into dwellings or business enterprises, small, really small shops, um, or a mix of both. The study of the informal dwellings then reveals how the structures are uh, are utilized, how the space is transformed, how the space is used, how these structures accommodate the lived spaces and, and, and the livelihoods of its inhabitants. Um, it also, the study of these informal structures allow us to uh, understand the material practices, uh, revealing uh, this uh, concept of ongoing and continuous transformation and continuous improvement where the structures initially, uh, perhaps structures that were initially intended to be, uh, to be temporary, they often become permanent. I'm pretty sure this was intended to be a temporary structure, right? That it had the aspiration that it will at some point will become a more permanent construction. The same in here, right? And over time, it becomes a permanent construction. These transformations, these special practices of a of dwelling and livelihood uh, needs where sleeping, uh, living, and working all coexist in, in the same interior spaces. So when I look at typologies, so I studied all, what are the characteristics of informal housing? in the US and in Latin America? What are the commonalities? What are the differences? Uh, what, are the, what are the threads that connect all of this? The most, uh, or the, the most predominant um, housing, informal housing typology in, uh, in the US includes manufacture, mobile homes, and trailer homes. And in order to understand 
these typologies of housing, which I'm quite sure you all are familiar, you all have seen trailer parks, you might have lived in trailer parks as well, but you might have not thought of them as, as permanent structures. In, in order to understand this typology, we need to look at the relationship between uh, immigrant labor and housing. In the US, housing precarity um, in the Latinx community has been persistent for decades. And, um, and trailer homes, mobile, mobile parks or trailer parks, barrack-like or barrack-style housing on farms and substandard homes have influenced uh, and, uh, the experience of generations of, of immigrants. While these architectural forms may have been originally conceived as temporary, they have, they have a, a become a housing typologies that are persistent enough through time, but ignored from public debate. When we look at the relationship between migrant labor and housing, it's very, it's quite clear that the US uh, has a long history of uh, oppressive uh, um, oppression towards uh, immigrant labor, uh, special uh, Latinx uh, labor, and that sustain and continues to sustain for many years uh, industries as as the food like the food industry, the agriculture production, the service industry, the construction industry, and just to name a few. So all of those industries um, are really uh, rely, rely on immigrant labor. This, uh, this uh, oppressive history takes many forms uh, affecting the everyday life of uh, Latinx communities that struggle between the tensions between, of being essential labor for, an essential labor force, but simultaneously remain invisible in many ways to society. Farm labor is, is intrinsically connected with housing. The Bracero program started in 1942 and was one of the first mass housing experiments uh, of Latinx workers on farm owner housing. Since the Bracero program, housing provided by employers on farms has been a, a typical practice. This practice of owner provided housing has a largely a disregard and dehumanize a, a Latinx workers, forcing them to, to live in poor housing conditions. And we're gonna look at some examples of this. In 1942, when the Bracero program started, it was established as a Mexican farm labor program through an executive order to hire temporary Mexican workers or Mexican laborers to work in the US agriculture and railroad system. The program was based on short-term contracts and took advantage of cheap labor and exploitive labor conditions. The provided housing was set to accommodate large numbers of workers uh, that were male. And this type of housing took the form of bank houses or, or barrack style housing or tents, makeshift structures, really uh, precarious structures. And these accommodations had of course many issues, lack of privacy, uh, having multiple, there are, I, these are images from from the uh, Library of Congress. And uh, while I was doing research on this, I, I, I found images of, of some of these uh, uh, um, uh, restroom areas where you had like, the, it was the lack of privacy 
was so brutal that they had multiple toilets without any partition. On the other hand, the workers were subject to an hyper surveillance and, and they experienced isolation because they were living in remote areas. Trailer homes have been widely used as a form of employer provided a housing in, 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 for farm workers. And this is, this type of housing is the predominantly type of housing in, in small towns and in rural areas in the United States. Manufactured mobile homes and trailer homes have, a, have performed different uses through, through history and depending to so, different social and economic needs. Since World War II, the production of manufactured housing has become a vital component of the housing stock for low income, uh, for all low income housing. Through history, trailer homes have been perceived as temporary solution of housing with the idea of seeking later a more permanent solution or with the expectation of accessing to a more traditional housing later on as a permanent goal. However, these structures have been around long enough that we can consider them permanent structures. When we look at the farm workers and, and the relationship between migrant labor and housing, we we immediately see, like through my through my research, I can I, I immediately see that even after 80 years of the inception of the Bracero program, when I study the housing conditions, the current housing conditions of Latinx farm workers in the U.S., um, this there are similar housing struggles. There are similar housing conditions for farm owner uh, provided housing. And one could argue that almost a century later, the, the conditions have not even have not improved or have even become worse. These trailer homes are usually run down, sometimes a lack of access to potable water, heated water, lack of heating and insulation. They have issues of a, a, in the building envelope and they, they suffer from a, a pest infestations. Trailer homes in farms have been intentionally concealed from the public view, um, from the public road and they have been placed away behind agricultural buildings. In addition to trailer homes, also other agricultural buildings have been used as, a, as housing as well, where, where some of the very basic housing spaces occur uh, where agricultural equipment is, is stored. Um, as a migrant justice uh, organization reports, and I'm gonna quote this uh, from them, one, on one half, when they were describing, when they described this, this type of structures, uh, on one half, uh, quote, on one half, they still keep the tractors, on the other half is where we live, okay? And these structures are most of the time not conditioned. And these are cases in Vermont eh, of the dairy farm workers. Do you guys know how the weather is in Vermont, how winters are in Vermont, right? So you can imagine not, not having a conditioned space there. So, the substandard housing conditions, of course, directly impact the health and the opportunities of Latinx immigrants to be included and to be integrated in the American social fabric. 
the hurdles to access to safe and secure housing in the Latinx community are all are of course interconnected with their immigration statuses and their limit and this limit their access to community resources. In Mississippi, the Latinx community is limited in general to um, housing stock that is deteriorated with unsafe and unhealthy conditions. As a community organizer explains, quote, our community live in what we call the trailers. Many of these houses are dangerous environments for the health, especially on drinking water. There are issues of lead contamination, end of quote. In addition to precarious housing conditions, and in order to pay rent, Latinx families it sometimes experience overcrowding living conditions with multiple families sharing one house or one unit. It's common to observe two or three families sharing one housing unit. As a Latinx community member who was detained in the immigration raids in Mississippi in August 2019, and later released with an uncle monitor explained Quote, I know of people who have moved to other to other people's homes because they were not able to pay the rent or because they don't have all the money for the rent. I know the people that have to share a house this way. A lot of families because of the same, because their father was detained, because their mother was detained because of the raids or simply because no, now there is no place to work. These overcrowded housing conditions impact nearly every aspect of human life. Children's education, children's access into schools, their personal relationships, their health. Undocumented Latinx immigrants are not eligible for any benefits of any housing assistance or subsidized programs. Oftentimes, we forget about that. Not being able to qualify for benefits especially is especially important when their job precarity is threatened, like in cases of immigration raids. This reality gives them very limited options and are given them, uh, and they are forced to rent dilapidated properties, enduring substandard conditions, even though they are paying marketplace, mar market rate. So it's not that the substandard conditions are more affordable, okay? Although these housing typologies have very limited uh, possibilities to be transformed, unlike other types of informal housing, where you can have rooms added, Trailer homes have been a, offer a, give users in trailer homes have been able to adjust and, and, and adapt some of these spaces to address their housing needs. So in this case, a, this, this drawing is based on interviews and field work on a, on a, a of a Latinx a, a chicken plant worker that um, they had to add a partition to to their living room to accommodate um, to accommodate family members that had to leave had to um, that were evicted from their previous house due to uh, the detention and. And, and deportation of the breadwinner of, of the family. So we can see some of, when we start looking at the ways that people transform their housing units, the way that people use their housing units, we can see some commonalities and some differences uh, between uh, the production, the social production of informal housing in the US and, and, and in Latin America. Uh, 
in both cases, they attempt to solve their, uh, their housing needs. Like I said earlier, in Latin America, there are different levels of consolidation of informal housing, and they, um, and they tend to be visible and concentrated. Informal housing in Latin America is, tends to be visible and concentrated, while in the US is more concealed and dispersed. Even trailer parks that are clustered, they are dispersed within rural areas or urban fabric small towns. So the different underlying processes of how collective actions and the sense of collectiveness impact the different uh, ways the community is able to organize or not able to organize to claim the right to the city. Trailer homes have been widely used as a form of employer provided housing for farm workers living in, in, in farms in, and in small areas across the US. So it is important for architects, and, and I want to, to end with this, this final thought, it is important to for as architects and responsible uh, professionals of the built environment uh, to critically understand informal housing practices to develop effective tools and instruments to intervene in the context of informality, to capitalize on community assets, to create innovative opportunities to improve the overall well-being and the life of its inhabitants. We need to work towards innovative and inclusive solutions to facilitate incremental self-help and self-improvement housing practices, ensuring access and affordability as well as good quality housing. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you, Sylvina. Um, I, I'm going to start out with a question that's related to your conclusions. Um, could you maybe give an example of, um, particularly the first point of, you know, what would what would uh, you know, as architects, architecture students, you know, what would be an example of something that um, we can learn from perhaps some of the examples that you showed in terms of, you know, how we think about housing? Well, I think uh, when I, when I, when I look at the to understand special practices, to understand how people occupy their spaces, how people transform the spaces in the, at the small scale, right? And use that to develop tools and instruments to being able to effectively intervene in the urban fabric. So anytime you work on, an, um, on a context where you have informal housing, you need to understand what are the particularities of that of that social production of housing, how people is living, how people live in those spaces, how they occupy, how they transform, what are the values, what are the assets of those spaces, and capitalize on that rather than use preconceived notions, perhaps that we as architects and I'm also blame for it to think more from a formal approach or from more a, 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 an aesthetic approach a, a, without really understanding the, the cultural value and, and the social value a, of these places. Does that make sense? Yeah, thanks. <laughs> okay, audience, um, raise your hand if you have a, oh, Blaine's gonna start us off. <laughs> 
Thank you, Sylvina. I know we have students who are going to ask questions, so I, I want to get my question out quickly before uh, we have others. But you mentioned, the, I see the word innovative occur a couple of times in this conclusion slide, and I've long been interested in the role of innovation in informal settlements uh, that we can learn from innovative practices that originate within informal settlements themselves. Certainly, there's an innovation in satisfying and meeting needs and, uh, and with real constraints. But I think there's, I, I'd just be interested to hear your thoughts about creative practices that develop within informal settlements that we can learn from. Yes, absolutely. So like, like you mentioned, like inno innovative practices or creative practices that, uh, that are the result to solve immediate needs. They solve the access to housing, right? Like you need like a, a space to, to dwell, but also oftentimes like many of the examples that I show, like a space to work, like the need of creating a livelihood to survive basically. Um, so there is, I think there is re really great value on understanding how these spaces are produced and what kind of, what kind of relationships they create, not only in the domestic, in the domestic sphere, but also in the public sphere. Like we saw like many of these examples, I'm trying to look at this one, um, right? Where this, this, these places kind of grew spontaneously trying to address some of these immediate needs, but they result in a in a negotiation of the uh, of uh, the public space or an a blur the delineation between the public space and the private space that now becomes this you might think like this is like kind of the original like the southern porch right but it's really not it is this is the the it's part of a business, right? Like it's kind of clear here, like, and in this business you have grocery store, you also get like a, 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 your jeans. You can't see it very well in this picture, but there is this is a, this is a mannequin with a jean, you know, you, you get everything there, right? Like it's, and it's, and it's not that you find one of these small business enterprises isolated in a mass of housing. So these are part of embedded on the fabric, okay? So there is the, I think coming back to the innovation, like the, the hybridization of the mixed uses and, and, and a, where a, there is not a clear division of living and working, right? I think that offers a lot of opportunities that we can learn also how the public space is delineated as well. Um, and, and, and all these interstitial spaces that are created. Yeah, I think also like the one from Peru, because you know, this may not be like that first floor was probably what was built first, and that was the living space. Mm -hmm. And then you know, build up and then that becomes the business. Mm -hmm. So that kind of fluidity of use is, you know, is, is part of that. Yeah, so this was what yeah. it was built first and then half of it becomes, you see like this is what it looks like a garage. This became like a business. So then you have the entrance to the back area. And then you see here, a lot of these things you learn by reading what it's out there. So you need to just like, as architects, like stop and, and observe and, and learn how to read the build environment. So you see like a staircase here. Why, why would you have a staircase in the middle of the road? It is in the middle of the road, right? So again, like this idea of blurring the public and private space, but it also gives you access to the second level, right? So you can have one, the one family living downstairs behind the 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 business and then another family so a rental property upstairs and then you can see that even like a, a later addition of a more precarious more temporary that 
it will soon become brick, okay? So they start with lighter materials and they slowly become and transform on brick. And I think I, some of this even like show that uh, you, you have the, the, the reinforcement of the structure is, is still like, a, they are left the reinforcement, even though they built up to this level to continue going because they know that they're gonna add a third floor later on. And that's become kind of a, a, a evolving over time. And this one, for example, you can see like even like sustain aspects of what you might think sustainability and recycling out of a addressing a pressing need. So you see like all of this is, is material that has been salvaged from other construction and is stored here for future improvement or future expansion or adding the floor, the interior uh, flooring of this unit. Like even the, 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 the roof is, is very uh, temporary here, right? Like because it's gonna continue growing upward, right? So there is this idea of continuous improvement um, that is inherently to this, to, to the informal housing. Okay, who out there has a question? And say, state your name at the beginning, please. Yeah, level. <laughs> Hi, my name is Kayla. I'm a first year and I was wondering if there are any organizations that we can look to as examples that you either like know or work with um, that's primary focus is to combat informal housing. That, say that again, please. That's are what... there any organizations that you work with that we can look to that combat informal housing? That combat? combat? Well, like try to not like resolve, okay. but yes. So I think there is there is a first um, there there is a first thing that I think we kind of maybe like the thinking about the language of how do we understand it's not really like it's not about combating or like it's really capitalizing on the assets and trying to um, to intervene there. A, to create positive change rather than a, rather than a completing a, changing the trajectory okay because I think a, a, oftentimes we only see these places as problems but there is a lot of entrepreneurship here that we need to learn from it a, of course there are many needs that need to be solved but a, a, so maybe a, like how, how do we tap into these existing synergies and, and work with them? Uh, yes, I can, I mean, um, in the US, uh, I, I don't collaborate uh, particularly with organizations that are working around informal housing, but in my, in the, in the, my hometown where I am uh, living in Starville, I collaborate with uh, una, una, several organizations that are working with issues related to housing insecurity, that it's it has some a, 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 a kind of a common aspects. There are international organizations that work in their work on urban informality. My connection to the organizations has always been locally because I I do go to these places and I talk with people. So the type of research that I do is, is less about a generalization in a way, but it's more about learning from the ground. So I do, I do sites, uh, visits and field observations. So in Uruguay, uh, I, I'm from Uruguay. So uh, for me, it's, um, it's a, it is a, something that it's a, those relationships are there, are the neighborhoods that I know, are like the neighbors that I know, people that I know. Um, when I went to Peru, we work with colleagues in Peru and we had connections, we, we made connections with a community organization that uh, was the organization of one of those neighborhoods. Uh, but they're usually not, 
nonprofits are like just a grassroots organized folks that uh, I think are more the most effective ways to connect with the communities. Of course, there are like these larger uh, um, uh, nonprofits that work uh, abroad, like uh, you probably have heard of Techos, uh, um, but uh, they are, they do work in communities, but they are like, they, they have their own structure. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, ah, okay, yeah, let's see. Come around. <laughs> oh, sorry. Hi, my name is Leo. Um, my question is, you mentioned earlier something about those informal communities in South America, especially in places like Lima and Peru. So you talked about how they had a communal aspect to the informal housing and self-help housing that they make there that helped them create these like grassroots like movements or, or grassroots communities that um, had sort of some sort of sway. And I wanted to and I was wondering how much kind of power they were able to like win for themselves or how much like self-actualization mm -hmm. comes from that like community organizing. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, so when I include this quote because it was from a resident and a community activist. So I think it depends on the communities. Uh, some communities are more organized than others, right? And, I, and so I collaborate in my research with a sociologist that it's really more kind of their, their expertise of understand like issues of governance and, 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 and community organization. But um, when it comes to, uh, to, to the relationship of housing and sense of ownership, and uh, there are like, because there are not like exclusive boundaries of private and pro um, public and private property, this kind of collective uh, uh, negotiation and sense of collectiveness, it's it's kind of a natural and emerge emerges naturally because you have to negotiate with your neighbor, like how do you uh, are gonna how you're gonna build because my party wall is his his kitchen, you know, like it it, it is part of coexisting in the same space. So there is not that you don't have that in the case of the US, when you have like a more clear delineation of public and private space. And also when a, a when there is less less density, like and oftentimes the cases that I was showing is like of urban informality are like, it's really not urban informality in those cases, it's informal housing in rural areas. So it's dispersed. So there is no much of a negotiation that needs to occur. So, but that dispersion also it, it kind of influenced the lack of a, a sense of collectiveness and, and ability to claim that right a, to the city and that grassroots of organization. So I think the proximity in a way, like kind of the physical proximity is what it enables a lot of the things. Thank you. Uh, my name is Daniel. I'm a freshman student. Uh, my question is, how do you think we can, we as an architect students, can we start to think about solutions for these kind of like projects? I'm from Colombia. I know these kind of like places. Uh, and I know this problematic is all around Latin America. Like in Brazil, we have the favelas. In Colombia, we have comunas. In mm -hmm. Peru, mm -hmm. it's a really huge problem that is like happening all around the world. Mm -hmm. 
uh, how you think we can like start thinking about solutions? Do you think it's more about education, like try to educate people how to like build more organized or is a problem that should be addressed more by the government? I think, I mean, what you say is interesting. I think as architects, like the transference, transference of knowledge is also important. We probably are gonna learn more from them than we're gonna be able to teach them, you know? A, of a, but a, in terms of kind of a, a, a material practices, but yes, transfer of knowledge of a, how to ensure, for example, that a, a room is ventilated, right? That it has a window, so it has direct access to fresh air and daylight, right? Like making this kind of connections and this creating this awareness is important. Uh, oftentimes, uh, some of the things are not really kind of uh, conceived or considered at all. Uh, and I think we can use our design skills or professional skills to, to transfer that some of that knowledge. I think that could be, that could be a, one way a, a, of, of intervening, right? Without really you building something or designing something, it's transferring knowledge. Another way will be like building and, 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 and how do you build around a, uh, around a, a, this environment, right? Um, I would say a, really embracing what are the characteristics of the place rather than imposing other, other a, a preconceived notions a, that may disrupt a, 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 the neighborhoods. So there are, and, and Colombia and Medellin, there are like fantastic examples of so of the social urbanism program um, where they intervene in the in the in the communas uh, in creating infrastructure um, staircases to facilitate access uh, to the areas that are the housing areas that are in in, in the in the upper parts of the mountains or a um, Public buildings, eh, like uh, like schools and and and, and libraries and, and 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 offering bringing those services, bringing those resources to the community. That's really really important. Without necessarily like building I houses, so. right? Because that's already happening. <laughs> yeah, I think that's really interesting. Try to instead of like destroying the whole places and build out. Whole new neighbor is kind of like what they have, try to organize it and make it work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, thank yeah. you. Okay, I'll come here. Okay. <laughs> oh, my name is uh, Michael. I'm a first year student. Uh, throughout this entire lecture, it really hit home to me because my family is originally from Jamaica and our like family home is situated straight in. Uh, what is now can I really can describe as an informal community. And one of the most recent things that my dad had been told about that they had repaved the road that comes up to our house and other people's houses because no one was doing anything about it. It was just like this little off-road in the hills and no one had done anything about it. So my question is just how involved is like the local or even bigger governments of these countries with these informal communities? Do they like hinder them? Do they help them? Or do they kind of just leave them their, to their own devices? That's a good question. <laughs> so I think it, depend, it depends on like each, not even the country, because it's not something that it might happen like at the country level. It's more like kind of at the city urban level government. So more at the local government, uh, like it was explained here. Like it was not, it was non-existent <laughs> in, in this particular case. But I think uh, there are cases like Medellin, you know, where you have like an active program that is a, a, that is bringing those resources to to the commune, the communes. Uh, there are in, in Bogota that also has examples like that. 
in Brazil, in the favelas, there are many examples of a, of a social infrastructure in, in the favelas, in Montevideo, in Uruguay too. So there are like in, in Argentina too. So it, I think it depends, it, it depends on, on, on the context, but there, there are like, there are many, yeah. So I think usually the problem is, it's not that it's, Sometimes it's not as much as it is ignored, is that it's it is hard to catch up with the speed of this spontaneous ongoing construction, right? So we don't have the tools, like and, and governments don't have the tools and resources to kind of and the time, time is to to catch up with this development. So we have to just embrace it. Like we already know we're not gonna be able to, like the way that we think about organization and order, that's not gonna work here, right? So we have to come up with new strategies to intervene there. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Sometimes when elections are going on. Yes, yes. <laughs> Suddenly you get uh, a, a concrete staircase in exchange for a lot of votes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, unfortunately, not everywhere, but yeah. 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 Hi, my name is Sedona. I'm architectural uh, specimen. Uh, as someone who lived in a trailer park in a period of my time uh, with another family, how would we be able to increase the amount of space in a trailer park without increasing the amount of money it would cost to live in it, as well as not taking up somebody else's space at a household? That's a really great design question. We should do studio about it. <laughs> um, well, I, yeah, I agree. I think we, we should do a study about like thinking about like these structures that were intended to be, to be a, a temporary structures, like they become like a permanent solution and they are there. So how do we embrace them rather than ignore them, um, work with them? So like the example that I, that I show you at the very end, like that was a kind of a quick solution based on the need, you know, like this was a living kind of was a living room area. And then you suddenly, your family has another, like three more family members that need to be moved in and they need, they need a space. So this was quickly transformed into a sleeping area. And then the kitchen became the dining slash living room slash all communal space for for the housing unit so like more like internal subdivisions but it, i think it's it, it will be really an interesting kind of a exercise to think about is it possible to instead of doing internal subdivisions a, like what kind of additions we could do yeah mm -hmm. i think it's a could be a design exercise mm -hmm. My name is Morgan, but I was just going to ask on a more personal note, what got you involved in this or interested? And then how do you think that's affected some of your work outside of uh, your research and the work that you've done in America and South America as well? Oh, well, that's a great question. Um, so I'm I'm originally from Uruguay. I kind of briefly mentioned that. Um, I came to the US, so I'm an immigrant in this country. I came to the US 15 years ago when I met Nadia, <laughs> Professor Anderson. <laughs> um, so to graduate school. So I went to Iowa State University. And when I came, I only thought I was gonna be here for two years and I was gonna go back. Like I was gonna return to to Uruguay and I was gonna practice architecture there. But then like kind of life has other 
plants, right? <laughs> it, and so I, it took me a while to really kind of um, build my identity as also as an immigrant, thinking that I was going to be here permanent, you know, uh, or more permanent. Um, so I think that has to do has has to has definitely influenced my work in relationship to immigration and housing. Um, also, when um, I grew up in a an, in an environment like some of you have mentioned here, that it, it was an ongoing construction. So these are places that are familiar to me. That they were so familiar that I could not see them. I needed some distance and, and, and moving to the US allowed me to get that distance to, to being able to study this, this, this context, if that makes sense. So it was so close that I, it was part of the daily life. So I couldn't like really um, detach from it. So I think the distance has allowed me to do that, um, also it ha it kind of happened that when I moved to the U.S. in two thousand, the end of two thousand eight, um, the largest immigration raid at that moment occurred in Iowa in Postville, and it, so it happened like I think a year before or like or some months before that. So when I got there, there was kind of this recovery process that was going on. So I I not directly, but I got I got very aware and involved in in, 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 in different ways on that. Um, and then when I when I moved to Mississippi, like I moved there and a semester later the the largest at that time, immigration rate occur in like a basically in in our backyard, you know, like not in my town, but like really close. Um, so it is it's really difficult to not be involved. It's hard to not be involved, right? Um, um, yeah. Thank you. I think it affects everything that I do. <laughs> if that's the short answer. Okay. All right, I'm gradually moving backwards. <laughs> Anybody? Hmm. We're all looking at the ground. <laughs> oh, okay, sorry. See, I, I'm looking back there at everybody. <laughs> um, hi, my name's David. Um, in your like research of talking to people in these informal housings, um, do you get the sense that there would be like a resistance to like major changes if there was to try to be like shiftings of like either going like, say, for example, street by street, updating like the houses and creating like an infrastructure? Would there be, do you get the sense that there'd be more of a resistance to that versus like having people just like build a complete new city and have everybody move to there? Like, is there like, do people have like kind of this sense of identity in the roots that they've put down and would be more resistant to like having a major shift like that versus like kind of what be more natural of the, of the growing of like more individual basis. So do you get this? Yeah. <laughs> is there like a sense of resistance to the change that would benefit them? Sense of resistance, I don't know, uh, but sense of ownership, yes, and 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 I'm I'm proud as well. You know, it, it, so this it is hard to not be proud of of a house that you built with your hands, right? You build it. You like it's part of your history. It's part of your family history. You want to like, that's the wealth that you will pass on, right? So there is a lot of proud on that and and and, and cherish and, 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 and people is really like, um, really uh, 
happy when they when they tell the story like even though the story might not be happy <laughs> like for moments but like they are really willing to share their stories because they are proud about it and um, so in terms of change i think um, like i said before a lot of this kind of changes not necessarily need to be like interventions in the housing itself but more in the access to resources and infrastructure that is i think it's what it's lacking because people build their homes right they fund their resources they build their homes they help each other so it's not that i build my home and you build yours we help each other and that also creates a sense of collectiveness a sense of community and their shared stories right um so, but I think it, 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 like it, resistance to change, I would, I would say there's no resistance to change because they are changing all, continuously. Right. So they're always thinking about improvement and changing. So, but top down impose change, maybe yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, we got another one. I was gonna say I can always throw another one out there. <laughs> you guys are all making me think about things. But I think this will be our, probably our last question. Hello, my name is Anna. I'm a first year student. Um, what do you feel like could be implemented, like economically, to help resolve? Um, global housing crisis? <laughs> That's a big question, yeah. <laughs> Only if I had the magic one. <laughs> um, economically? Yes. I'm thinking. <laughs> well, like more housing, definitely, right? Um, there's not enough housing that is adequate and it's affordable. I would say like that's not an issue only in the United States. It's not an issue only uh, in in Latin America. I think now it's 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 global. And we we like we probably have heard about like the global crisis of housing. So, um, so subsidies. I I mean, subsidized housing, uh, public housing, social housing. All of those are like help to address some of those needs it, it won't it won't be able to solve the problem entirely you know because it has to become sustainable and 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 one of the things that i that i've seen doing research on housing insecurity is um one once the house is secure right once like a household or family is able to access to housing um, that is a decent. Uh, it allows them to to create wealth, to generate wealth, to do other investments, to really like. I think it's a very first step. Um, I don't know about honestly, like a the economics aspects much of the relationship of if jobs need to come first or housing i think it is it is really a complicated wicked problem that is not it requires multiple solutions not not only one it's a multi-dimensional pro problem in a way sorry i don't have an answer <laughs> it's fine thank you <laughs> Okay, yeah, that was a that was a tough one. I would say a lot of that depends on where you are, yeah. right? Because yeah. different ways housing is produced and also financed mm -hmm. in different locations, you know, vary even different locations within the US, it varies a lot. And that's but that's something that's understanding that system as well as yeah. the kind of architectural system is really important. <laughs> 
So, I, all right. I, I mean, I think in the US, like kind of following up on that, like more systems that are more like similar to land trusts or housing cooperatives, mm -hmm. that is not something that is being really explored. It could be, it could help. Yeah, I mean, that builds on the idea of the collective mm -hmm, mm -hmm. rather than we see housing very much as an individual, a house on a lot or a townhouse that is a subdivision mm -hmm. and the collective piece, yeah. um, you know, like you were talking about in, in Lima is, especially in the U.S., is something that we have tend to associate housing, the American dream, right, is that your household owns its own individual thing and we never have to rely on our truck talk to our neighbors and we could probably learn something <laughs> about that okay well, thank you Selena. thank you thank you everybody All right.